Good morning and welcome to the National World War II Museum's Lunchbox Lecture for December. My name is Maggie Hartley and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Engagement here at the museum and we're so excited that you guys have joined us today, both our in-person audience as well as our online audience through Vimeo and Facebook. Just so you know, we will be having this lecture today with entitled The Raid at Pearl Harbor with Captain Rick Jacobs. Following the lecture, we will have a Q&A. So for our online audience, you can put your questions into the comments on Vimeo. If you're watching on Facebook, you can put them into the comments on the Facebook video. But for our in-person audience, all you'll have to do is raise your hand and I'll be coming right by with a microphone so you can ask your questions in person as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Captain Rick Jacobs for today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, from the 17th century, Japan was a closed kingdom ruled by fe a feudal military system. Europeans that came there either forswore Christianity or they were executed. Uh, the, the Dutch East India Company had rights to, uh, to, to trade, but only through the port of Nagasaki. Uh, others who landed on Jap Japan's shores unwelcomed, were executed. Uh, in the 19th century, however, Russian whalers began uh, encroaching from the north and American merchant ships and whalers from the south. Um, the Japanese tried to make some minor concessions, but nothing that was really substantial. That ended in 1852 and 1854 when Commodore Matthew Perry showed up with a modern uh, fleet and exercised diplomacy with force, uh, including a cannonade in Tokyo Bay. Thanks to that, he managed to negotiate a treaty of peace and amity, guaranteeing good treatment for shipwrecked sailors and a consul for the United States uh, who would be in permanent residence. A celebratory banquet shown here, uh, that's a contemporary Japanese painting. And I think one of the interesting things about it is look at the size of these cannons. This in particular. Now th up in the upper right, that's the actual size of a Dahlgren gun. And so I think what this tells us is how, how large the modern armaments weighed in the Japanese mind because they had nothing like it whatsoever. Um, the power of the modern industrial state was also apparent to the Japanese in events in China. For, beginning about 1839, the European powers incringed on, impinged on China, uh, and as you may have heard of, 1839 is the first opium war, of which there were two more. Um, China was supine before the uh, rapacious appetites of the Europeans, and so that was an object lesson for the Japanese. You would either modernize or you too would be taken care of by, uh, by, the, by the foreign powers. Now that a samurai from about the 1860s is what Perry met. Um, and that's what had to face the, that Dahlgren gun that he had. So to avoid the fate of the Chinese, the Japanese rapidly industrialized and westernized. In 40 years or less, this is what their army looked like. Uh, this is the Battle of Pyongyang in the uh, First Sino-Japanese War. It's called the First Sino-Japanese War, but in point of fact, the Chinese and the Japanese had been fighting one another since there were Chinese and Japanese. Um, the, the Japanese easily won and tried to, wanted to seize the Korean Peninsula, but the European powers, France, uh, Russia, and Germany all intervened to take away a lot of the fruits of their victory. This was infuriating to the Japanese, who felt humiliated at this, at, at this raw display of force by the Western powers. Uh, they were bitter, but they were confident. They knew how to, uh, how to fight in the modern uh, warfare. 
They were determined to get revenge and determined to get control of Korea. And to do that, they launched the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 with a surprise attack on the Russian fleet at Port Arthur. A surprise naval attack. It has a certain ring to it, doesn't it? Uh, now, if you look at the uniforms, on the, those are Japanese uh, soldiers marching. Look at them. They, that's indistinguishable from a modern army. And think back to our samurai friend with that armor on him. They had come a long way in a short time. Now, uh, I don't know if you can see it in this uh, photo, but the Japanese officers still wore their samurai swords, which means that they had adopted a lot of the methods of the West, but they still had a lot of the old Japan in them. Now, the war was won, the Russo-Japanese War was won, at the Battle of Tsushima, when Admiral Togo, that gentleman with all the uh, braid on our right there, met the uh, Russian fleet at, uh, at the Straits of Tsushima. It's quite a trip, uh, a trek. The Japanese bottled up. They, what, what the Japanese didn't sink of the Russian Pacific fleet at Port Arthur, they bottled up in the harbor. So the Russian Baltic fleet literally sailed around the world past the Cape of Good Hope and up to Japan, a, an incredible journey, tens of thousands of miles, uh, where they met the Japanese fleet to be sunk at, uh, at Tsushima. Now, with that, Japan was confirmed as one of the great powers of the world, even though Theodore Roosevelt intervened and didn't give them quite all they wanted uh, in the peace treaties. Japan then fought alongside the Allies uh, in World War II, having become an ally of Britain, a formal alliance with the British after the Russo-Japanese War. Now, this was a, a matter of great prestige and joy to the Japanese, that the number one imperial power in the world, Great Britain, would take them as an ally. Um, so they fought together with the uh, Allies in World War I, and they did right well after the uh, war. They seized the German colonies of the Marshalls, the Carolines, and the Mariana Islands, as well as Qingtao on the Shantung Peninsula of China. Um, Qingtao, according to the Treaty of Versailles, should have gone back to the Chinese, but the Japanese never gave it to them. And that's one of the reasons the United States refused to sign the Versailles Treaty. More tension between the United States and Japan developed over the policy of uh, the U.S. policy of immigration, which excluded the Japanese. This was much to the fury of the Japanese because it was apparent to them that they were being regarded as sort of second-class human beings, and they were particularly infuriated by that because they regarded other people as second-class human beings. Uh, there's no racism like that of a racist, eh? So, now, after uh, World War I, the, the prevailing theory was that the terrible bloodshed of World War I was in large part called, caused by the arms race, the, greedy, the, the greed of the arms manufacturers. Britain, ex financially and emotionally exhausted by the First World War, uh, engineered and pushed for naval treaties, and so the Washington and London Naval Treaties in 1922 and 1930 were, uh, were signed. In these treaties, there was a ratio of five to five to three capital ships, five American capital ships, five British capital ships, to three Japanese capital ships. Now, to make that palatable to the Japanese, we agreed not to fortify any places in the Western Pacific, giving them tremendous advantages of time and distance, not to mention the fact that our efforts would naturally be divided between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, the British similarly had divided interests, but the Japanese again felt humiliated by this. They were a great power. Why were they not allowed to have the same status uh, number of ships as the other great powers. 
to persuade America to agree to this treaty, um, the, uh, the British relinquished their alliance with the Japanese. Again, the Japanese felt humiliated. They took great pride in being an ally of the number one imperial power. And they, were, they felt uh, cast aside, as it were, isolated, humiliated at losing the alliance and having to agree to fewer warships than the other great powers. During the 1920s and 1930s, the Japanese military took effective control of the Japanese government. Um, they occupied Tokyo in February of 1936, and they reinforced their uh, control of the civilian government via assassinations. Junior officers in the army would assassinate a senior politician and then be tried and given the most lenient of sentences and set free almost immediately. Uh, this gentleman, Prime Minister Hamaguchi, Osachi Hamaguchi, or Hamaguchi Osachi, uh, was killed by a nationalist fanatic after signing the London Naval Treaty. The army's principal interest was China, where it was a law unto itself, the Japanese army. Uh, it had been campaigning there since the 1890s and conquered Manchuria largely on its own initiative in 1931 and 32. China, to quote, suffered the consequences of a baffling interplay of national, regional, and personality clashes, bedeviled by intrigue, backstabbing, and double dealing of staggering dimensions. The increasing exasperation and despair of the ordinary peasantry, the emergence of powerful radical and revolutionary forces, there was total disintegration of society. That was the way of, of China it, by the 1930s. As you probably know, uh, the Chinese Communist Rebellion was gaining force. Um, so the Japanese, to the Japanese, this looked like opportunity. Um, and they invaded China. Uh, they were branded aggressors uh, and le therefore, thereby left the League of Nations in 1933 and signed the Anti-Comintern Pact with Germany and Italy in 1936. In 1937, Army Firebrands engineered the Marco Polo Bridge incident and invaded China proper. What followed is some of the most brutal warfare in the history of warfare, which is almost invariably brutal anyway. Um, Shanghai fell in November 1937, followed by the rape of Nanking, said to be the biggest slaughter in human history. The death toll in Nanking exceeded 100,000, and estimates are as high as 300,000, including literally tens of thousands of women who were raped and then killed. Um, this uh, shows a, a Chinese man being executed there. There are some other pictures around uh, of the competition of the swords. Two Japanese officers took to see if they could execute 100 men each with their samurai swords. Um, brutal. Um, 1938 saw Japanese victories in the Yangtze Valley they conquered 700,000 square miles and 170 million people. But the triumphant Japanese found themselves confronting the Clausewitzian dictum that it may be easy to conquer, it is difficult to occupy. Uh, we have had our own bitter experience of that uh, lesson as well. The arrogance of the Japanese army grew apace. In 1937, they strafed the British ambassador to China and attacked the American gunboat Panay and the British Ladybird. Tokyo quickly apologized and offered compensation. But America as a nation was outraged and condemned the aggression against China all the more fervently. FDR, whose ancestors uh, had been Chinese missionaries, was very emotionally involved in the China War. In 1938 and 1939, saw major clashes between the Japanese army and the Russian army. 
uh, along the Manchurian-Siberian border. The Red Army under General Georgi Zhukov, who would rise to great fame during World War II, inflicted a total and humiliating defeat on the Japanese. A Japanese expeditionary force of 15,000 men suffered over 11,000 casualties. The Imperial Army realized it was outclassed by the Russians in armor, artillery, and aircraft. Now this was important because the Japanese saw the outbreak of war in Europe as a golden opportunity. The occupying powers, to use that phrase, uh, the Europeans in Asia were occupied by fighting the Germans in Europe. And so the, will, the riches of the East seemed open to them. It was uh, opportunity knocking and a chance to, for Japan to fulfill its destiny of bringing all of Asia under the divine rule of the emperor. There were two possible strategies. They could take advantage of the German attack on Russia and go north, or they could uh, go south and seize the riches of the Indies. Now, after Nomonhan, the Japanese army didn't have much taste to fight the Russians again, not to mention that they were fully occupied uh, fighting in China. So that made going south look all the more attractive. There were the riches of the Indies, as I said, the southern resources area, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, particularly Indonesia, which with its oil. As for sort of supporting an ally, the Germans, the Germans signed the non-aggression pact with the Russians while the Japanese were fighting them at, uh, in Manchuria. So there wasn't a whole lot of uh, feeling in Japan that they needed to stand by their German allies. Another uh, incentive to go south was that America had recently passed the Two Ocean Navy Act. Um, and that meant that the Japanese Navy was doomed to second-class status after a certain amount of time. Um, America's financial and industrial resources were overwhelming compared to Japan's. And so our, so our Navy would also be. The Japanese reckoned that by 1943, the decline would be overwhelming. So the Navy argued, leave the Russians to the Germans, who seem to be doing a pretty good job of kicking them around, and seize the southern resources area. It's got oil, it's got rubber, it's got rice, it's got wealth. The obstacle was the attitude of America and its control of the Philippine archipelago right there. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, the, the archipelago was directly on the lines of communication from the riches of the Indies back to Japan. And so it was a threat. Uh, and they felt they, they had to deal with it. My personal opinion is they should have gone ahead and attacked in the south. And I don't believe uh, America would have gone to war. But that's just me standing here 67, well, 80 years later. Uh, the Japanese thought it was too much of a threat, and they had to deal with America if they were going to go to the South. Now, the question we ask ourselves is, what was America doing there? How did we get to the Far East and need to defend the Philippines? And, of course, the answer goes back to the Spanish-American War, which many regard as the opening war of imperial America, our overseas uh, ambitions. We had... The doctrine of manifest destiny had carried, carried us across a continent, and now it was time to go even further. Um, so uh, we're fulfilling the zeitgeist of manifest destiny, and we took the Philippines and Guam from Spain, and that brought us into direct contact with Japan. Army strategy against the Japanese was to hold Corregidor, which, in accordance with the Washington Naval Treaty, was the only fortified spot in the Philippine Islands. Um, they would have to hold it for six months to two years while the Navy fought its way across the Pacific. The Navy developed War Plan Orange, largely at the Naval War College in Newport, and it thought the idea of arriving in the Philippines before Corregidor Fall 
fell nonsense, basically. It wasn't going to happen. They gave no credence to the ability to hold the, uh, hold the Philippines and set out on our own strategy of island hopping across the Pacific, which eventually we implemented, and in my humble opinion, that's what won the war in the Pacific. Um, but that's a talk for another day, I suppose. This is Pearl Harbor. Now, despite the parlous state of the American uh, military in the 1930s, FDR adopted an increasingly aggressive attitude towards Japan. Um, what he wanted to do was fight the Germans, but he was, he was tied emotionally to China, and he kept poking his finger in the chest of the Japanese. The U.S. Pacific Fleet was based in San Diego, but after the 1940 maneuvers in Hawaiian waters, Roosevelt ordered them to remain at Pearl Harbor, sending a message that mission so cherished by politicians to defer Japanese aggression. Meanwhile, FDR increased support for Britain against Germany. Navy vessels escorted eastbound convoys to the mid-Atlantic, trading fire with German U-boats, sinking them and being sunk. Admiral J.O. Richardson, that rather crusty looking fellow on our right, uh, was strongly opposed to that. And he strongly objected, not so much to the uh, naval war against Germany, but to keeping the fleet at Pearl Harbor. Um, it was 2,000 miles from Hawaii to San Diego. And the support that the fleet needed, the docks, the trained uh, repairmen, that was all back in San Diego. Not to mention it was exposed to the Japanese. Um, he argued, Richardson argued, the only real deterrent to the Japanese was the fleet itself. And that would be better served and more of a threat back in San Diego than it would be forward in Pearl Harbor, where it was dangerously exposed and poorly defended. He robustly expressed that opinion in Washington, D.C. He questioned General George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, about the lack of anti-aircraft artillery and long-range search planes needed to protect the fleet in Hawaii, which was an Army responsibility. He forcefully declared his position face to face with President Roosevelt in October 1940, and the President respond, responded by relieving him of duty in January 1941, a year early. Well, that, uh, that lesson was not lost on the new commander, Admiral Husband Kimmel. Kimmel was no pushover, but firing Richardson emphatically ended the argument about where the fleet should be stationed. It was going to be in Hawaii. That was a done deal. Uh, or rather, I should say, the part of the fleet that remained in the Pacific because ships kept going to the Atlantic. If you look at that picture on the right, how revealing is that? There's Kimmel uh, by then with his four stars, and you'll notice the chart they're looking at is a chart of the Atlantic. Hmm. So, apart from losing uh, parts of his command, which he needed, uh, there was a question of what defense condition to maintain. Um, if you put the fleet on a war footing, you don't do training and you don't do maintenance. And that means over time, its readiness must deteriorate. If you emphasize readiness, then it's not necessarily ready to fight at all times. Um, it can't stay indefinitely on a war footing. Um, Kimmel got several messages from Washington telling him that war with Japan was imminent. But when he asked if he should go to uh, a full war footing, the Navy always minimized the immediacy of the threat. Now, the forward strategy was par partly determined by the new super weapon, the B-17 Flying Fortress. It promised to fulfill the theories of Douay and Mitchell that wars would be won by air power alone. With increasing numbers coming into service, America increased its forward posture. 
the Philippines would not be abandoned, a strategy repugnant to the army. Douglas MacArthur and the Philippine army were a call to the colors, and 35 B-17s stationed in the Philippines at the expense of reinforcing Hawaii. In March 1941, Japanese troops garrisoned Saigon in French Indochina, then confiscated the rice crop. Germany invaded Russia in June, and the collapse of, the Soviet, uh, uh, the collapse of Soviet resistance seemed imminent. The next month, Japan proclaimed a protectorate over French Indochina. America, Britain, and Holland immediately froze all Japanese uh, assets and imposed, imposed a trade embargo. On August 1st, FDR embargoed high-octane gas and crude oil. America was the leading oil producer of the day, and without its products, Japanese industries would be paralyzed within a year, its navy disabled in two. On October 16th, General Hideki Tojo became the new prime minister, a general. Every aspect of Japanese political, economic, and social life was now subordinated to the military and regimented for the purpose of serving the war effort. Talking is thirsty work. Whoops. In November 1940, the Royal Navy attacked the Italian fleet in, in the harbor of Toronto with 20 obsolescent biplanes flying from a single carrier. They sank three battleships and damaged two others. The Imperial Japanese Navy had a vastly more powerful air arm known as the Kido Butai, six large fleet carriers with 400 modern airplanes in a revolutionary concentration of air power at sea. I want to emphasize that. No one had ever put six carriers together in a single operational unit. The Japanese were the first to do that. This is one of the reasons it was the attack on Pearl Harbor was such a surprise that the Japanese could amass so many aircraft in one place at one time. The Japanese sailors and airmen were second to none, and looking at the results of Toronto, Admiral Isoroko Yamamoto, commander of the Japanese Combined Fleet, thought a surprise attack on the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor could produce strategic results. Now look at this. In, on the upper right, that is the swordfish bomber that carried out the raid on Toronto. And compare it to the Japanese planes. The Zero, as good a fighter as there was in the world, the Val dive bomber, and the Kate torpedo bomber, also a, a, a level bomber. Uh, no comparison. Numbers and quality. And again, their airmen were as good as any in the world. Pearl Harbor, the raid on Pearl Harbor, and I want to emphasize the word raid, uh, was just one part of an audacious plan that spanned a quarter of the globe. As the bombs fell in Hawaii, troops would land in Malaya and Thailand, followed shortly by action against Borneo and the Philippines. The operational objective of the raid was to cripple U.S. naval power in the Pacific for six months, allowing Japan time to seize the southern resources area and set up a defensive perimeter. That was the Japanese strategy, not to conquer the United States, but to, to push us back for a while. By the time we could counterattack, they would be dug in, and the losses, uh, the U.S. would just find the losses in counterattacking unacceptable, and we would negotiate a, a peace treaty, much as the Russians had done in 1905. On November 26, 1941, the Kido Butai sailed from the Kurile Islands. Six days out, the message came to climb Mount Nitaka, and that was the order to proceed with the attack on Pearl Harbor. The ships turned west into stormy seas and overcast skies, hiding in the foul weather and sailing far from the shipping lanes. At 2100 on December 6th, Admiral Togo's battle flag from Tsushima was hoisted over Akagi 
and the carrier is turned south and bent on 26 knots. At 0600 the next morning, December 7th, 275 miles north of Pearl Harbor, the first wave of 140 bombers and 43 Zero fighters launched. A second wave followed, 350 planes in all, magnificently trained and eager for battle. One pilot exulted, an air attack on Hawaii, a dream come true. We would teach the arrogant Anglo-Saxon scoundrels a lesson. At 0740, the lead planes ducked under the overcast and saw the coast of Oahu 50 miles away, undefended. The strike leader, Commander Mitsuo Fushida, broke radio silence to signal Tora, 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 meaning they had achieved surprise. Now, much to the objection of the airmen, the planned raid included a submarine, uh, a submarine force, including five midget submarines that were supposed to penetrate Pearl Harbor. At 0342 on uh, December 7th, in other words, four hours before Fushida ducks beneath those clouds, the minesweeper Condor, a converted fishing boat patrolling the approaches to Pearl Harbor, sighted a periscope and alerted the 1918 vintage destroyer Ward by Blinker. There's the Ward. I think that's her World War I camouflage. Uh, working at night with only binoculars and primitive sonar, Ward searched for nearly three hours with no result. False periscope sightings were far from unheard of, but the Ward took her picket duty d in deadly earnest and persisted until she found the enemy at 0645. She attacked it once with guns and depth charges, destroying the sub. Ward promptly reported the engagement to 14th Naval District headquarters, which notified the Pacific Fleet duty officer who called Kimmel at his headquarters ashore at 0725. Now that seems like a lot of steps from somebody in the ward saying, oh gosh, something's going on here, and Admiral Kimmel getting it, that's what we call the chain of command. And that's, you follow those, those things. Uh, the ward was not working for Kimmel. It was working for 14th Naval District. At any rate, Kimmel finished dressing and headed for his office. He was alert, but unaware air attack was imminent. About the time Fushida signaled Tora, 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 Rear Admiral William Furlong, SOPA, uh, senior officer present afloat, came onto the quarter deck of his flagship Oglala to observe Sunday colors. Awaiting the 0800 ceremony, he saw a plane bank over Naval Air Station Ford Island and heard an explosion. The Admiral thought, what a stupid, careless pilot. But as the plane banked, he saw the rising sun insignia and shouted, Japanese, man your stations, then ordered all ships in harbor sortie. Now you can see from this chart that there's the Oglala and there's the explosion on Fort Island from West Virginia. Ensign Roland Brooks, who was officer of the deck, thought the blast on Fort Island was an explosion aboard the California. Oops, there we go. Okay. Ah. Too many buttons, too many buttons. Let's go back. There we go. So he thought it was a blast aboard the, we aboard the California, and he called away the fire and rescue party, thinking they would go to the assistance of the California. Now that fortuitously brought a large organized body of men with equipment topside. They reached the quarter deck just as West Virginia was hit by the first of six or seven torpedoes. You can see the line in red points to what looked to be torpedo tracks. Some think there was actually a midget submarine in the harbor at that time. Uh, certainly, there no, we don't see any airplanes in this photo. Um, be that as it may, um, leading the damage, the damage control party aboard West Virginia was Lieutenant, later Admiral, Claude Ricketts. And he immediately saw the manning of weapons and gun directors the ship, the, the ship, the West Virginia, quickly listed to port from the, from the torpedo hits, and Ricketts went below 
to counter flood spaces, prevent, which prevented the ship from capsizing. The crew calmly evacuated the wounded while ammunition trains were organized to support the guns. West Virginia's captain, Mervyn Benyon, was severely wounded by bomb fragments but refused evacuation, remaining exposed to enemy fire while fighting a ship from the bridge. I have drawn that rectangle around the location of the bridge of the West Virginia. So you can imagine with the smoke and the fire and the noise what it was like to stay there. Uh, and that's what uh, Captain Benyon did. Um, this is from Lieutenant Rickard's after action report. Heavy black smoke poured up over the bridge and boat deck forward. The bridge was covered with fire. The personnel, the personnel I left with the captain had been forced to leave him and come aft for air. I went forward and found him partly conscious. The bridge was completely obliterated with heavy black smoke. Lieutenant J.G. White, one enlisted man, and I attempted to fight the heavy fire on the forward part of the bridge, but the water pressure was not enough to have much effect. About this time, Leek came to me and said, Mr. Rickett, Mr. Ricketts, the captain is about gone. Mess attendant Doris Miller was one of the brave sailors on the bridge that terrible morning. His battle station was in an ammunition magazine below decks, but he found it wrecked and went up on deck to see what he could do to help. Because of his size and strength, he was detailed to move the wounded to safer areas, then later sent to the bridge. He, w he boxed for the Navy, and you can look at him. That's a substantial-sized uh, man. That's the Navy Cross on his uniform there, and this is the citation for the Navy Cross he got. For distinguished devotion to duty, extraordinary courage, and disregard of his own personal safety. While at the side of his captain on the bridge, Miller, despite enemy strafing and bombing in the f and in the face of serious fire, assisted in moving his captain, who had been mortally wounded, to a place of greater safety and later manned and operated a machine gun directly at, directed at enemy aircraft until ordered to leave the bridge. Petty Officer Miller was lost when the escort carrier Liscombe Bay was sunk in the Gilberts in November 1943. West Virginia sank, but thank, thanks to then Lieutenant Ricketts' efforts did not capsize. Of a crew that fought so bravely to save their ship, Captain Benyon and 104 men were killed and 52 wounded. Just before colors, a torpedo passed underneath the repair ship Vestal and hit the battleship Arizona tied up inboard, followed by a 16-inch armor-piercing artillery shell modified to be dropped from the air. It donated one of the forward magazines, producing a massive explosion that sent a sheet of flames 500 feet into the air. You can see it there. Of the crew of 1,500, over 1,100 were killed, including Fra Captain Franklin Van Valkenburg and Admiral Isaac Kidd. That's the uh, gentleman for whom the destroyer kid that's now tied up at Baton Rouge is named. Admiral Kimmel had a clear view uh, of what was going on from the front lawn of his quarters. He saw Arizona lift out of the water, then sink back down, way down. He was shocked but composed. As he watched the battle from, the, uh, from, from this location, overlooking the harbor, he was hit in the chest by a spent 50 caliber bullet. Kimmel murmured, it would have been merciful had it killed me. The repair ship Vestal, moored outboard of Arizona, was hit by two, two bombs and heavily aflame when the explosion of the Arizona blew out the fires and blew a hundred men overboard, including the captain, Casson Young. Someone cried out, abandon ship. Then to quote Gordon Prang, a figure like some strange sea creature climbed out of the harbor and stood athwart the gangway. It was Young, oil dripping from his face and body, but none the worse for his dunking. Where the hell do you think you're going? He demanded of the officer of the deck. We're abandoning ship, the man replied. Get back aboard, young Lord. You don't abandon ship on me. With that, the crew returned to their stations and saved the ship. 
Young was promoted to captain and given command of the cruiser San Francisco, where he was killed while fighting his ship in the first naval battle of Guadalcanal. A brave and dedicated man. Battleship Oklahoma was hit by three torpedoes in the first minutes of the attack and quickly took on a severe list to port. Abandoned ship was ordered minutes later at 0820, just before she turned turtle. 415 sailors died aboard her. You can see there's some cables wrapped around the hull of the Oklahoma there. Uh, we undertook an incredible salvage operation on the Oklahoma that took something like two years to write her. Uh, and by the time that was done, it was 1943, 1944, and the ship was not needed yet. But, but it had become a matter of honor to the Navy to salvage the Oklahoma. Battleship California had her hatches and scuttles open for an inspection the next day. So when two torpedoes hit at 0805, she rapidly took on water. Counter flooding kept her on an even keel, even after being hit again. And the crew labored magnificently to get underway. But at 910, burning oil swept down from windward, engulfing the stern in flames and forcing the captain to order abandoned ship. You can see the flames, uh, or at least the smoke, wrapping around the ship. Now, let's see if I can make this thing work. Here is the USS Nevada. Well, I could almost make it work. Let's see. There's Nevada. You can see the California down by the uh, bows. Nevada was, uh, was moored all the way forward on Battleship Row. Uh, her anti-aircraft batteries responded quickly, but a torpedo hit her forward and opened a 45 by 30 foot hole. There was some flooding. Nevertheless, the duty officer decided to get underway. During the height of strafing and bombing, Chief Boson's mate Edwin Hill led the line handling detail onto the quay, cast off the lines, and swam back to his ship. With all eyes in the harbor fixed on Nevada, she, she, uh, Lieutenant Commander Francis Thomas conned her over a mile towards the harbor entrance through an inferno of smoke, explosions, and fire. He was under repeated attack the whole way. Nevada was down by the bow, and if she sank in the channel, the fleet would be bottled up for many months. Commander Thomas decided he had to beach her. That he did, on he beached her on Hospital Point, and Boson uh, Hill led the anchor detail to the forecastle to secure the ship. While attempting to let go anchors, he was blown overboard and killed by the explosion of several bombs. For his bravery that day, Mr. Hill was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Now, the ships were only one target of the Japanese. The aircraft were equally important in their mind because in order for the fleet the Japanese fleet to get away, they had to neutralize the air power on Oahu. American air power had to be destroyed, so half the attack was against the uh, airfields. The main Army fighter base at Wheeler in central Oahu had dirt bunkers and walls 10 feet high. But to protect the planes, General Walter Short, Army commander in Hawaii, he protected them against Sabotage, which he thought was the biggest risk, ordered all planes lined up on the runways where they could be guarded. The neatly parked aircraft exploded and set off the adjacent uh, airplanes. Half the fighter planes at Wheeler and half the bombers at Hickam were destroyed or badly damaged. Most of the Navy's PBY search planes were also destroyed. The Japanese were elated. One later wrote, looking at my comrades in their planes, I could see them grinning, hungry for good games. Wheeler A Air Base was a sea of fire, which I don't think is any exaggeration if you look at that uh, photo there. Finding no opposition in the air, Japanese planes dropped to treetop height to strafe. At Schofield Barracks, adjacent to Wheeler, Lieutenant Stephen Saltzman and Sergeant Lowell Klatt 
grabbed the Browning automatic rifles and exchanged fire with an oncoming Japanese plane. As the G Zero pulled up to avoid high tension wires, the GIs emptied their magazines, shooting it down. One of only 29 enemy planes lost that day. What a terrible sight Pearl Harbor was that morning. The harbor was a hell pit of smoke, gray, brown, white, lemon, yellow, black, and black again, acrid, foul, mushrooming billows erupting skyward like a mass of storm clouds. That's some Gordon Prang's uh, At Dawn We Slept. And you can see the Oklahoma capsized at uh, the left front of that picture. Now, here's some more devastation for you. Now, the argument goes that the Japanese should have uh, gone back for another raid. Commander Fushida claims he wanted to make another strike to finish off the battleships, take out the dockyards and maintenance shops, and destroy the huge fuel storage tanks, forcing the Pacific Fleet back to California, an argument made by many historians after the fact. Fushida says that on returning to Akagi, he went to the bridge to press his views on Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, the Japanese commander. Asked where the American carriers were, he replied, no doubt, uh, no doubt hunting the Japanese at that moment, a thought that must have sent a chill across the flag bridge. According to Gordon Prang, when Fushida left, Commander Minoru Genda, fleet air officer, said the Zeros will take care of the enemy bombers and urged Nagumo to hunt down the U.S. carriers, even if it took days. Now, uh, in the more recent book, Shattered Sword, which is a terrific book uh, for those of you who are interested in reading about these things, uh, the authors claim that Fushida was, uh, not to put it too harshly, exaggerating all of this, that he never actually went up to the flag bridge. And in my experience of admirals, few and far between are those commanders who go up to him and start really telling him what to do like that. But um, at any rate, clearly the firebrands were all for staying and fighting the matter through, at least after the fact. But they were not responsible for the Kido Butai. Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo was. He was told damage to aircraft and airfields was uncertain, so not only might he face enemy carriers, but also substantially intact land-based air. He had brooded over the danger of the mission for months, and no doubt recalled September war games where two carriers were lost and a third damaged by counterattacking American forces. The carriers were essential for the, conduct, for the conquest of the Indies, the reason Japan went to war to begin with. When he asked Fushida if the American fleet could operate out of Pearl Harbor for six months, he was told no, they could not. That was the mission Yamamoto assigned him. And having accomplished it, Nagumo departed with his ships undamaged. Any criticism for failure to continue the battle in Hawaiian waters rests more promptly with Yamamoto and his framing of the objective. That the missing three U.S. air carriers where a threat was proven six months later when just such a force sank four Japanese carriers in a matter of four hours. I, 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 really, I can't emphasize that enough, that Nagumo is given a mission. It was, his mission was not to destroy Pearl Harbor ultimately and wipe out the American fleet. Had it been, he might have acted differently. His mission was a raid, and he needed to get those carriers east, so that, uh, I'm sorry, west, so that he could uh, fulfill the other part of his mission. God, that's a terrible sight. Although a hard blow, the long-term damage to American power was comparatively light. Of necessity, the loss of the battle line focused U.S. naval strategy on carrier warfare, key to the war in the Pacific. Obsolete battleships were sunk in the most convenient way, with a cruel but limited loss of life. Had they been sunk at sea, thousands more sailors would have drowned. Instead, those veterans were released to become the nucleus of the vastly expanded Pacific fleet, 
that would cross the ocean and avenge Pearl Harbor. Well, who was responsible for the debacle at Pearl Harbor? Admiral Kimmel and General Short were relieved of command. They could have had better support, but Admiral Ernest King, who became the chief of naval operations afterwards, made this brutal but necessary judgment. Uh, and not just on Short and Kimmel, but also on Admiral Stark, who was the chief of naval operations at the time of the raid. Admiral Stark and Admiral Kimmel were the responsible officers. The derelictions indicate lack of the superior judgment necessary for exercising command commensurate with their rank and their assigned duties, rather than culpable inefficiency. Relegation of both these officers to positions in which lack of superior judgment may not result in future errors is appropriate. Ultimate responsibility must rest with President Roosevelt. It was his policy that put the fleet in an exposed position where the Japanese could attack it while diverting resources to the Atlantic and the Philippines. Admiral Richardson correctly judged FDR's policy a bluff, one the Japanese then called. But as opposed to admirals and generals, only the people can fire the President of the United States, and they can do that only every four years. Now, some historians say the Japanese lost the war when they bombed Pearl Harbor, that an American victory would inevitably follow because America was larger, richer, more industrialized, and so on and so on. But on that day in December, the Japanese commanded a mighty fleet. Their army was battle-hardened and victorious, their soldiers and sailors brave, disciplined, and well-trained. From Alexander's conquest of Persia to the Vietnam War and beyond, History is filled with lesser powers defeating greater ones. To, some, to imply the American triumph was pre preordained belittles the valor of our fathers and our own great heritage. Thank you. Thank you. She, uh, they, they, they righted her. I'm not sure if she ever actually rejoined the fleet but they did write her and clean her up. Okay, so real quick, we're gonna move into our Q&A section. So if you do have any questions, please raise your hand and our online audience, just a reminder, you can place your questions within the chat section on Vimeo or within the comments on Facebook. So we're gonna come back here to the back first. Were there a lot of submarines at the, at, in Hawaii at the time of the attack? There were, you're talking about U.S. or Japanese? U.S. Right. There were several. I, I, I don't have the exact number. Uh, Nimitz was a uh, submarine sailor, and uh, when he came out and took command of the fleet at the end of December, he raised his flag on a U.S. submarine. Hey, Rick, very good. Um, Thank you. Can you explain what the Orange Plan was? Oh, boy. Uh, well, briefly, uh, the plan was, was what we executed after 1943, at the end of 1943. A march across the Central Pacific, island hopping, building bases as we went. The Navy never thought it was going to be a quick war and that we would need a fleet train, something that could maintain the fleet, uh, the, the repair ships and supply ships and so on and so forth, and we would need bases along the way. There is a book called War Plan Orange, if you're interested, that's, that's not bad, uh, pretty good. I, I think that's the best I can do on War Plan Orange at the, at the moment. Uh, if if you, we could have a drink sometime, I could take an hour and a half and uh, tell you about it. <laughs> so <laughs> Real quick, we're going to take a question from Vimeo. Um, there was no mention of the Stanvac oil refinery in Bataan in the oil embargo of July of 1941. I'm curious about your thoughts on this. I'm sorry? Say that again? So we had a viewer who said that there was no mention of the Stanvac oil refinery in Bataan with the oil embargo of July of 1941. And so she was curious about your thoughts okay. on this. I, I'm not familiar with the Stanvac oil refinery. Um, uh, as, as for the oil embargo, I believe I did cover that. Um, uh, 
that it was one of the big causes of, of the Japanese attack because they were going to run out of oil. We were the, we were the OPEC of the era. And uh, if we refused to sell oil to the Japanese, within one to two years, they wouldn't have any oil. Uh, yes, in the movie Torah, 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 which I'm sure has a lot that's inaccurate, Yamamoto is quoted as saying, I fear we may have awakened the sleeping giant. So did he really say that, do you think? Or did he have reservations about this attack? Well, you know, after the fact, he is, he's said to have said, uh, I will run wild for six months. After that, uh, it, it'll be grim. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell after the fact what these people really thought because Yamamoto was killed when? At the end of 1942 or the beginning of 1943. Um, by, by that point, the Japanese had not definitely lost the war, but things were looking pretty grim for them. Um, I don't know. I, I also think there's a tendency after the fact to say, Oh, look, he never wanted to do it. He was, he was a good guy, just, you know, they forced him into it. He was a warrior. And in, in general, warriors like to go have fights. So we have another question from Facebook. So how quickly did the U.S. Navy begin to build new ships? Did the attack lead to an emphasis on carrier warfare? Uh, the answer is we had already started to build ships before the attack, the Two Ocean Navy Act, which I, which I mentioned, had lots of ships under construction, and this continued. We figured out some new, uh, some new devices, like um, putting a carrier deck on a Liberty ship hull, and that's what gave us the escort carriers. Uh, it definitely led to an emphasis on carrier warfare. The, the gun admirals, the battleship admirals, didn't necessarily surrender right away, but they moved further and further to the back of the line as, uh, as time progressed. Did I answer that? Okay. Uh, as the young lady behind me mentioned earlier, we see a lot of things in popular culture about, you know, advanced notices and what's, what to believe, what not to believe. If, um, whether that's true or not, let's just say some of it's true. So, you know, you mentioned seeing the periscope. If we had had an hour or so notice, would it have really made any difference with 350 planes coming? Could we really have defended Pearl Harbor with what we had? Uh, it, I think it definitely would have made a difference uh, in that you could have put the ships in readiness. In other words, they could have, they could have gone to what we call uh, general quarters, lock the watertight doors, perhaps get underway, get the steam going. It, it, you, these are steam-powered ships, and so it's not like a car where you just turn the key and drive away. It takes a certain amount of time to get, to get going. But yeah, I think it would have made uh, a difference because uh, people would have been prepared. Had, had Condor, you know, f uh, uh, or rather the ward, found that uh, submarine right away and sunk it and been able to convince those uh, up the chain of command that that had really happened, it could definitely have made a difference. As, as for the intel stuff, I tend to discount that. The, the, the problem with intelligence is that there's always too much of it. And they're always telling you everything. You know, uh, Clausewitz says, when the battle starts, people start coming from every direction telling you things, almost all of which is wrong. That's the world of intelligence. Well, it looks like that is okay. it for our Q&A today. Rick, I do want to thank you for joining us today. And I also want to thank our in-person audience for coming out, as well as our online audience for joining us for today's Launchbox Lecture. If you enjoyed this programming, I encourage you guys continue to check out our website, our Facebook page as well. And if you enjoy this topic in particular, we have lots of commemorative programming coming your way over the next week related to the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So thank you guys again so much. Thank you again, Rick. And we look forward to seeing you guys next time here at the National World War II Museum. Thank you. Thank you.